Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby of the Dallas Prospect, joined today by Kevin Gray Jr. of 105.3 The Fan to talk a little bit of Mavericks basketball. Kevin, how are you doing today? I'm well, man. Appreciate the invite. Happy to be here. Appreciate it. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, so we were talking a little bit just right before we started up here about the the team's recent kind of struggles, but a very solid bounce back last night. It's amazing how just winning a single game can kind of change the tune of the fan base a little bit. <laughs> You're on a three game slide for the first time in 22 months and rather than acknowledge, hey, this doesn't happen too often with this particular group. Everybody's like fire Rick trade Tim Hardaway <laughs> do this do that like it's chaos man. Yeah, the uh, overreaction can happen quite a bit throughout the ebbs and flows of a basketball season. And as you mentioned, they hadn't had a three game losing streak since March of 2019. So a lot of folks were thinking, well, what's going on with the Mavs and forgetting, hey, they're missing four guys and they're in a difficult stretch as far as a road trip is concerned. So uh, a little overreaction, but hey, a good win helps everybody breathe a little bit better. So, oh, Absolutely. And it's like, it's not even just that they're missing four guys. It's like very key players. You're not missing Wes Awundu on the bench. You're missing <laughs> two starters. You're missing Richardson, Dorian Finney-Smith. You're missing Maxi. You got Brunson back and uh, Hardaway came back after missing a game, but you're still not full strength. Dwight Powell. I mean, it's just, it's crazy looking at, uh, looking at the state of the team and how we've seen flashes of how good they can be. Mm-hmm. But people don't see that. They don't take that into account. They just base it on who's there. Oh, a one dude played 32 minutes the other night. How did he only give us six points? Yeah. Not taking into account that his role is not to be that guy. He's meant to be the back end of the bench. And if you're playing him 32 minutes, you've already had to go to the most dire straits. You must be (laughs) truly desperate to have to play Wes a one dude 32 minutes in this situation. Yeah, it's one of those things where Rick Carlisle has to remind folks a lot about the roles that certain guys have, because a lot of folks will just look at the box score and say, well, Wes Wounded went 0 for 6 from the field, only had a couple of points, you know, but he was a plus 10, you know, in the box, you know, the box column. So his role as a defensive player, being a guy who can defend out on the perimeter and provide versatility on the defensive end is something that Rick Carlisle appreciates and something that as the fan base continues to get to know this particular player, as long with others, they'll understand exactly what his role is, not necessarily just look to the box office and see what he did from a scoring standpoint. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, part of the the difficulty that's come during that stretch where they did lose the three straight, and we saw a little bit in, uh, in terms of similar ways of guarding Luka last night, although I think Dallas had a good counter for that, was they're throwing a lot of added pressure Luka's way. They're throwing two, sometimes three guys at him and basically saying like, hey, we know he can go off for 30, 40 points, whatever, and a triple-double. We're basically going to make him pass it and see if these other guys can beat us, see if they can knock down threes. They haven't really been doing that very well this year as a team, particularly from the corners. And uh, as Saad pointed out when I talked to him earlier this week on the on the show, uh, Dorian Finney-Smith was their best corner three shooter last year, so not having him is another one of those places where not often that you're kind of talking about offensively where you're missing Dorian Finney-Smith. It's a refreshing change, but right. it's uh, it's definitely a situation where it kind of took this team a little bit of time to figure it out. Obviously, it helps KP going insane mm. last night, but it, it's all the difference in the world when you guys are hitting shots and you're able to get the ball out quickly, which I think Luca was just absolutely putting on a clinic last night. And you yeah. saw the way the offense looked a lot more like itself, 124 points. And it's an offense that is predicated on a lot of ball movement, getting the ball out quickly. And Luka Doncic, you know, you talked about the creativity with respect to how he was creating the kind of passes that he was. I mean, it was important for Porzingis, especially playing at the five with Josh Green starting at the four, for him to get rolling toward the basket and create some easy opportunities and looks. And a lot of that was opened up by the fact that you had mentioned, you know, some of these junk defenses that they were playing, all you know, the box and ones, the sending the two and three guys at Luka, it forces these guys to not only make shots, but be movers without the basketball to give Luka the kind of passing lanes he needs to be able to find these guys. And if Luka has the ball in his hands, he's going to find you uh, and he's going to get you an opportunity to get a clean look. And Porzingis was the beneficiary of that against the Pacers. I love the way that he was moving without the basketball, exploiting obviously a team in the Pacers that were missing, that was missing a uh, miles Turner inside the middle. Right. It was very smart of him to be able to find himself getting inside and he got a lot of easy dunks and layups 
uh, to really play well against the Pacers. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned as well, KP, uh, running at the five last night, major beneficiary of that. Even voicing, you know, we know last year early on, he was very uh, hesitant about playing in the five, kind of made it known like he prefers the four. And it feels like he's finally kind of embraced the opposite role, in fact, where now he was talking post game about how, and this is this is before the postgame presser. This is when he was still on the court talking to Followell on them, basically saying um, that being the five opens him up a little bit more to whether it's to roll or pop. It makes it easier for him to find guys, and he's just more comfortable doing that. And Carlisle said that obviously helps spread things out for the offense, keeps um, makes the offense more efficient as well. And I think he was so he was what twelve of fifteen for the game mm-hmm. and eleven of twelve from two point field goals. A lot of those, whether it was the alley-oop connection or just shots right around the rim, just getting to the basket and Luca finding them or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't ask for a better setup than that. Like you're, you're getting already a guy that's a dynamic scorer, easy baskets around the rim. And when you're talking about a guy as well, who has, you know, he's, he's still early in his comeback for this season. So you're getting him easy shots and not having to worry about rust where now you have to worry about if he's 0 of 5 or 0 of 6 on threes in a game, if he's going to sink into a little bit of a rut because you're keeping him, you're keeping him with those high efficiency goals yeah. and uh, allowing him to build confidence and rhythm that way. Yeah, and Porzingis has talked about the fact that he is was much further along in terms of his rehab and his conditioning and his ability to get up shots this time around dealing with the torn meniscus than he was when he first came back from the ACL injury. So he was able to hit the ground running a little bit more this time around just given the nature of the injury and how quickly he was able to start getting shots up and getting into the kind of conditioning so that once he got back on the floor, he wouldn't have the prolonged kind of rust that you would see from a guy who dealt with previous injuries before. And I just love the two man game that the two of them were playing against the Pacers. You could tell that both of them were reading each other well and Porzingis moving without the basketball and Luca finding him that five open offense that they had where things were spread out with him at the five and being able to move things and spread things out really opened up a lot of passing lanes, not just for him, but for other guys, for Willie Cauley Stein and others throughout the night. I just made it a really good night, especially when you had 12 assists, but more so Luca was talking about after the game. Also, even just some of the extra passes to create extra ball movement to get guys open Hockey is, is yeah. important. Also, when you're trying to, you know, defend the guy who's getting two and three guys ran at him to be able to find those extra passes to get easy offense for other guys, too. So, yeah, absolutely. And I wonder, you know, we, we know the Mavericks like to to spread it out, move the ball. Like we were saying earlier, they they went nuts scoring in the paint in the game i think they had Mm -hmm. 68 for the game they only averaged like 42 43 a game for the season so i wonder how much of that obviously you said earlier miles turner not playing big beneficiary there um i wonder how much of that we might see with that just given the team's struggles shooting the ball from three overall in the season in those corner threes as i mentioned so i wonder if we're going to see them with kp at the five and we saw how you know, and when he broke out last January, finally kind of seemed like he got back to his old self a little bit. Mm-hmm. You saw him working a lot more, I felt like, around the basket and not just camping out for threes. And I wonder if that's going to be something that we see more of moving forward, if we're going to start to see that raise up from the low 40s, at least to a more respectable number where you're not, you know, solely relying on a long ball that's very hit or miss for this team. Yeah, and Porzingis has the kind of game from an offensive variety standpoint where he can get down on the block, can make some turnaround jumpers, can make some bank shots. He has a good offensive game on the block to where he can be effective down there. And I think teams are starting to understand, especially if Luka and this offense continues to adjust to the kind of defenses that they're playing, eventually you're going to have to stop playing those box of one type type of defenses on him because at some point you're just going to get two point to death. And all of a sudden, yeah. next thing you know, you got to start changing your looks on defense to hopefully where these other guys like Trey Burke, Tim Hardaway, and others can start getting back to hitting shots from the outside to make teams pay for the kind of defenses that they're playing against Luka and KP on a night-to-night basis. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, with with this team, um, with this team working like it has been, it's had to go through a a brutal stretch of the season. Obviously, we talked about how many guys have been out at times this year, but – they're still sitting at 500. They're still mm-hmm. sitting, I think, at the nine seed right now. Granted, it's 15 games in, so it, it's not really a, a sizable enough snapshot. But you see how up and down the league is and unpredictable. Like, it seems like we've seen more just 
ridiculous box scores and blowouts this year <laughs> than usual. Like the first one people pointed to was like the Mavericks up 50 on the Clippers at half, but you're seeing that it seems like every other night you're turning on the TV and mm-hmm. you'll have somebody blowing somebody out by just an insane margin whether it's the half or, you know, for the game or whatever, even the lowly wizards had a game where they beat up on like, I want to say Phoenix or something. And uh, it, it's, it's making it harder than ever to really gauge. Um, and part of that could just be the circumstances of this season. Like everybody's right. off, obviously like the wizards and Mavericks have been two of the teams hit harder than most by uh, COVID thus far and the health and safety protocols, as I guess I should phrase it. Right. But uh, <laughs> before the video gets flagged or something. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so they, they've they been hit by that. And that has certainly changed the equation of, um, you know, what you can expect. Not that you can compare two teams because matchups obviously matter. Like that's how you can have a team that's really good against 90% of the league and dominant, right. yet they face that one team that's not very good who for some reason they can't seem to beat. Similar things here, how even like a, a bad Wizards team overall is able to, you know, put a hurting on someone or, uh, you know, in the case of two teams that are currently in that playoff race, I think it was last night, you had the Warriors just curb stomp San Antonio. Mm-hmm. Those are two good teams, but it, between it being a small sampling at like 14, 15 games roughly, and just the state of the league and how these blowouts are happening all the time and with every combination of teams, it makes it really difficult to assess. Like we know the Mavericks have had one of the harder schedules this sure. year to date, and it's not getting easier just yet between going to San Antonio and then you've got Houston coming up, which I know Houston looks different, but still it's, it's tough to get a, a real grasp on this team. And yet you're still sitting right there, despite everything, your record, mm-hmm. health, all of that, you're sitting right there at, at nine and the distance between you and the Warriors at five is like a game. They're six, right. They're eight and six. You're seven and seven. Yeah, it, it's the teams who are able to handle adversity the best this year and be able to deal with the health and safety protocols that the NBA is putting into place and how they handle those. Those are going to be the teams that will find themselves playing the most consistent as well as they can be throughout the season. Because you mentioned the ebbs and flows of the season with players missing games, players coming back, trying to get into conditioning and rhythm. All of those things can contribute to a lot of blowouts in games where you would think teams would be much more competitive in a normal season when guys aren't missing the kinds of games that they are. Because if you're missing, if you're out due to the health and safety protocols, you may be out seven to 10 days and then you have to get yourself ramped back up as far as conditioning is concerned. And that takes a few games to be able to kind of do that. So you'll continue to see this, I think, throughout the season with these teams, how they handle everything but also how quickly can these players find themselves getting back into the kind of condition to allow themselves to play the kind of consistent basketball that most teams are capable of, especially when you start thinking about teams at the top of the East and West who have legitimate chances of winning an NBA championship. So whichever team is able to manage that the best, yeah, those are going to be the teams that you find that can be able to potentially compete, you know, for a championship this year. Yeah, for sure. And uh, elaborating on what I was talking about earlier with the difficulty of schedule, this is from uh, Reese Conkle on Twitter, basically pointing out that in the Mavericks first 14 games, uh, let's see, 11 of their first 15 on the road, Mm -hmm. 10 of those have come against playoff teams from last year. And uh, they still don't have a healthy roster, like a fully healthy roster. We don't have Richardson back or Maxi or Dorian Finney Smith, or I think Dwight's still out too. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, they're still missing several, key players but i I think that quarantine period is wrapping up now it's just going to be a matter of how quickly can you get them back in and back into the flow of things because yeah you can't just assume like oh richardson's back he's going to immediately go back to his production offensively and defensively necessarily Mm -hmm. of what he was it's kind of like you can try and stay in shape but when you're spending 11 days in a hotel room initially i know they're back in dallas now the guys that were in denver but when you're spending 11 days in a hotel room, it's a little bit difficult to, to be able to stay in shape when yeah. you don't even have access to like the, the gym and all of that. Yeah, and you kind of mentioned it with Jalen Brunson for a specific example. He had to go through individual workouts just to get himself back acclimated. He couldn't do team workouts and those kinds of things once he got back you know, to Dallas from being out there in Denver also. So it's going to be interesting to see how these players handle it and how each one handles it individually and how quickly they can get over you know, obviously what they're what they're dealing with, that's going to really determine how competitive these teams are, especially in the Mavericks case, once they get all their guys back for sure. Yeah. 
You mentioned uh, Brunson. He had a great game last night, uh, 19 points, three boards, four assists. This is from Mavs PR. Basically, in the three games that he has started, he's averaging 21, 3.3 rebounds, 4.3 assists on 57.5% shooting from two, 46% from three, and a perfect 11 of 11 at the line. That is a really, really strong uh, production there. I I felt like at the very start of the year, he was a little bit um, out of sorts, a little bit in terms of his assist to turnover ratio. But man, he's he's a really steady hand, and I mean that that's just that that uh, fully encapsulates his career. Whether you're talking about Villanova or what he's mm-hmm. been to the Mavericks thus far, just a really good steady hand guy for your team definitely helps you. He's never going to be a star player, but that's a guy that it's good to have in uh, in the quiver. Yeah, he's one of those perfect second unit guys, one of those glue guys that you need. Always remains ready, always professional for the most part, always comes in and does his job and provides you what you need, whether it be from an offensive standpoint, whether it be from a defensive standpoint. He's one of those guys that every title contending team needs to stay ready from night in to night out. You saw the example earlier in this season against the Chicago Bulls where he had to step in to the starting lineup, had 31 points in that particular game, played really Mm -hmm. well. He's just a really solid basketball player that every team could use, especially with his leadership. You mentioned being a Villanova. Villanova always puts out guys that are ready to play basketball once they step into the league for the most part. And Jalen Brunson kind of continues that lineage of Jay Wright basketball players that have excelled in the NBA. So, no, I love Jalen Brunson as a player and what he brings, his calm demeanor and dynamic to this team, I think is the presence that Burt Carlisle and this team loves uh, as they continue to play game after game with him. Yeah, and it definitely helps having a, a guy as well who can kind of create as, you know, mm-hmm. you have so many guys on this team. Like we talked about how in the bubble, and again, you didn't have Brunson there because of the the rotator cuff, but uh, you had Luca and Burke basically, and you had to add Burke at the last minute to really have guys right. that could kind of create offense. So having those two and uh, Brunson helps, and then you got guys that can kind of create their own shot a little bit with Hardaway. So this team, it, it's got a good balance, I think, of of players and they've shown great improvements on the defensive end. Obviously, we, we know I don't know where they currently rate in defensive efficiency, but they were as high as two just a couple games ago. And so obviously that's that's a significant growth. Luca in particular has yeah. gone miles of improvement on that end. And it's just a matter of if this team can finally, it feels like for the first time in a year, year and a half, yeah. maintain some semblance of health mm-hmm. to to get everybody in a rhythm and start to build in a positive direction because you see all these flashes and you know they, they're stars they've got the star power with their two guys they just have to have like you know without that third superstar you got to have a, a healthy assortment of guys who fit their role well I think they've got that but health is the next thing that they've just never been able to put out there it feels like yeah and you're right you know this is a team that without that kind of that second perimeter score that you would desire to have on a team like this who can consistently get you you know 20 25 a night a lot of different guys are going to have to fill that role obviously you know with KP's offense a lot of that offense is facilitated off of Luka Doncic and what he does from a passing standpoint but you need guys that can create their own shot, but also guys who are willing to be catch and shoot guys like a Trey Burke, like a Tim Hardaway Jr. When Dorian Finney-Smith comes back, all of these guys being able to fill their roles, especially for a team that can be as offensively dynamic as they have proven to be in the past, especially based off of Luka Doncic and his ability to create for these guys. So everyone has their specific role. I think that's one of the things that we enjoy about watching this team is that everyone understands their role and how to fill it. And when this team is fully healthy and available, you see guys like Maxi Kleba, one of the more versatile defenders in all of the NBA. He fits perfectly with what this team does from a three and D standpoint. And that's one thing I think a lot of Mavs fans like you and I are like, hey, let's just get this team fully healthy to see how they can perform together and they can gain some consistency throughout this season. And once they do, I think the sky's the limit for this team, especially knowing the kind of adversity they've gone through so far and how they've stayed been able to stem the tide a little bit until these guys eventually, you know, come back and get healthy. So, yeah. And, uh, and you mentioned, you know, with, with Luca creating for them, the sky is definitely the limit. Uh, A cool stat that popped out of the game last night. Luca is now the second fastest ever to uh, reach 30 triple doubles in NBA history behind only Oscar Robertson. 
Robertson did it in a, a stupid 75 games, 30 triple doubles right. in 75 <laughs> yeah. games. That that my eyes like bugged out of my head when I saw that. Yeah. Um, but Luca did it in 146, which is uh, basically More normal, right? <laughs> 44 games faster than Magic Johnson. So Luca's second fastest ever to 30 triple doubles. I know that you know with Luca, you can always it, you know people will talk about how you can always look at something from a different angle or like cut up the data in a different way to like show like oh the first time since he did this with 30 mm-hmm. points 12 assists 14 rebounds three <laughs> three blocks on a tuesday in april right uh, exactly. you can always spin things differently in espn who put this stat out uh, yeah but the broadcast had it last night too you know espn is about as guilty as anybody in terms of like really chopping up data from different ways but Regardless, uh, it, it, if nothing else, it speaks to just how insanely productive he's been that nobody has basic, only one guy ever has done, gotten to this point faster. It just shows his accelerated rate is beyond anything that we've seen, say, for Robertson. Yeah, and it's interesting because especially watching over the last three or four games, and I think it started in the second half against the Chicago Bulls. Of course, he had 30 points in the first half. Mm-hmm. He only had six in the second half. And he talked about how he, quote, unquote, played selfishly in that basketball game. And I think you've seen from since that point, he's made a more concerted effort to let the game come to him. Defenses are playing him a little bit differently as far as the coverages are concerned. And he's making a conscious effort, not that he didn't before, but it seems like even more so now getting his teammates involved because of how much defenses are keying in on him and really slowing things down and controlling the pace of these basketball games so that he's maybe not putting up the 25, the 28 points a night that he had been earlier this year, but he's doing the other things that allow this team to be much more consistent offensively and more importantly, get himself in a flow of being able to create for other guys. And you saw it come to fruition against the, you know, the Indiana Pacers, you know, had 12 assists and was able to really control the game because of how he was able to find guys. And I think as his game continues to evolve, obviously he's an all world player from an offensive standpoint, um, as long as he continues to improve things like free throw shooting and three point shooting, all those yeah. kinds of things. But the way he controls the game and how he is able to do so and evolving that from different ways that folks are playing defense against him. It's really fun to watch to see his evolution continue to grow as a basketball player. He was only still 22 years old at this point. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for last night's game, 13, 12, and 12 uh, in his stat line in 38 minutes, that's one of his lowest point totals of the night, but it's also, you know, he shot 15 shots. So it's not like he didn't get looks. He Mm -hmm. was five of 15 for the game, but you see, as you said, the other ways in which he can impact the game. uh, And that's a big part of really what makes him special. He basically said, all right, I'm going to be the distributor and I'm going to try and defend. I actually didn't think it was his strongest defensive game. I think he's a little, maybe a little bit tired from kind of having to shoulder this bird in the past few games Mm -hmm. with so little help, but uh, still he makes plays for you on that end as well. He gets a block in the game and he had definitely good possessions in there on the defensive end. So it's uh it's a really a testament to as you said his evolution his growth in that role and that's i mean that's what you have to do you have to be able to say like all right if i'm not scoring tonight if it's whether it's the defense literally throwing three guys at me and forcing it out of my hand or if just my shot's not falling fine let me find what is working if the three-point shot's working then great he can step into those and shoot those and he'll have games like uh, when he was six of 11, I want to say in that Chicago game, mm-hmm. or if he's having a game where it's one of six or something like that, he's evolved in that front where he'll, he'll attack the basket more. He'll get to the basket and he's so difficult to stop. If he gets around the basket last year was within four feet, I think like 72.3%, mm-hmm. uh, which is in the top five in the league in terms of finishing at the rim, which is fantastic. And, you know, for a guy that's not an explosive athlete or anything like that, just kind of the savvy, and uh, the footwork, the ambidextrous nature he has really works to his strength. So you see these different ways he's evolving to impact the game and make adjustments to what's happening. Now, yeah, he's got to round that free throw shooting and three-point shooting into form. I swear he can never shoot threes and free throws well in the same game. He picks one and goes <laughs> right. complete abandonment of the other. Yeah. But even still, he's he's showing great growth. He's added a mid-range game as well, it looks like, this year, which is serving him very well, especially with that being a more rare shot you see taken mm-hmm. in today's NBA. I think it's another thing that kind of keeps defenses honest because now – 
they know he loves to shoot step back threes. They know right. he's lethal if he gets to the rim, but now he's got that middle game. And so they, it takes it away. You know, before, if he drove off the three point line, it's like, oh, okay, he's either going to kick out or he's going all the way to the rim. Mm-hmm. Now defenses have no idea what to expect. Now they almost should dare him to shoot threes because that's probably of those three, his least, uh, least deadly thing he could throw at you some nights. Yeah, he's been able to evolve his game, especially, like you said, from a mid-range st- standpoint, the little floaters in the lane, some yep. of the creativity as far as some of the bank shots that he's starting to, to hit. Because you mentioned it, he can get to the rim anytime that he wants to. His ability to put guys on his hip, his ability to use angles to be able to get through guys. Underrated in terms of his strength, he goes, what, 6'7", 230. He doesn't look like it all the time. Mm-hmm. but He's underrated in terms of his strength and the amount of contact that he takes night in and night out and as he continues to put the totality of his offensive game into form there's not going to be much that defenses are going to be able to do to stop him especially when he's a pass first kind of guy and his ability to facilitate offense and then couple that with his offensive array yeah in a while here he's going to be very very difficult to stop stop no matter how you try to defend it or what you try to force him to do night in and night out yeah it's it's going to be interesting to see how this team can respond Obviously, the West is a, a, just a monster to deal with. Hopefully, they can actually get some of these guys back here soon and kind of finally give us a, a real glimpse of what this team is. We've yet to see this team at full strength, yet we've seen some very good highs from them in terms of their performance, whether it's Hardaway Jr. and Burke both going off. I, I, I know Burke had like, what, 22 last night. Uh, Hardaway had 19, I want to say. Mm-hmm. I mean, the fact that you're getting the production out of the three uh, – three, uh, former New York Knicks that you are just <laughs> it's it's funny that of that whole trade we, we basically found use for everyone and uh, New York has not been so lucky although I'm still mad at them for completely ruining Dennis Smith Jr. <laughs> so yeah it's yeah this, this team's got the got the depth I think to to do a lot and while there have been a lot of trials and tribulations through these first couple of weeks or a few weeks I should say it is something that assuming you avoid just disaster you're probably going to be the better for having had this experience and having had to force these young guys be it josh green or even tyrell terry the aforementioned uh wes Alundu, having to force them into the lineup and rotation i think you're going to be better off in the long run having gotten that experience for all of those guys no, no, I agree. And I think Rick Carlisle has done a really good job keeping this team with a level head, not getting too high, not getting too low as far as what this team has gone through, because, you know, every team is going to be dealing with this at some point during the season. The Mavericks seem like they're dealing with this a little bit earlier on in the season than for most teams. But at the same time, to be seven and seven, to still be able to find yourself continuing to stay the course with respect to how long the season is given the circumstances that these players are dealing with. It's a testament to how Rick Carlisle's leadership from the top down is helping this team be able to stay as even keel as it can to really make the adjustments that they need to while still understanding that you're going to have ebbs and flows and nights where you're going to blow out, you know, the Clippers by 51 and then turn around some nights and lose to Chicago by 16 on your own home floor. Yep. But understanding that that's all part of a difficult season that you have to go through and managing everything that they do. And I think Rick Carlisle is definitely the head of that with respect to how he's handling these things so far. Yeah. I mean, I mean Carlisle, you're never going to agree with every decision he makes. There's going sure. to be things. I mean, we, we, he's become like a punching bag for a large portion of the fan base, I think. And you're not going to agree with or even understand everything he does, but usually early on in these years, which was, um, you know, a point sod made the other day, he'll, he'll experiment. It seems like more, whether it's with his rotation or just kind of let guys play through things earlier in the year. And it's kind of like, it's experience on the fly and yeah, it might cost you a game or two here and there early on, but it's something that ultimately is working towards, rounding that player into form, getting the team kind of uh, different rotation patterns and all of that Mm -hmm. sorted out. And it usually benefits you down the stretch. I thought he was very good in the playoffs last year. I think given the, the stacked nature of what that Clippers team and what they were able to throw at Dallas, probably the worst matchup they could have had. And between him and Luca's brilliance in that series, you push it to six when people were saying you'd be lucky to get one. So That, that's something like it, it might not have been it won't be remembered in the same way as the the year I think it was 2014 
when uh, when the Mavericks pushed the one seed Spurs to seven. It won't be remembered in quite that light, but I think it was another very good series from Rick in that regard. And I think he's definitely the guy that you want in here, even though, like I said, there's going to be times where even on my show, I've said like, I don't understand that decision. I don't think that's what I would have done, but I'm not him. I don't have near the experience. So who am I to judge? All right, right. I think you mentioned it too. He's not afraid to experiment with rotations, with starting lineups, a lot of his stuff, especially this year, especially dealing with what they've dealt with from a health and safety you know, standpoint, mm-hmm. you're going to have to find different combinations and rotations for starters based on matchups, based on who's playing well, based on defensive lineups. We've seen Willie Cauley-Stein and Christoph Porzingis playing on the floor at the same time at the four and the five, because that's probably their best defensive lineup at this point. So Rick Carlisle is not afraid to figure out what combinations are working and to switch things up, which switch things up, which means – you have to have a team full of professionals like the Tim Hardaway's, the Maxi Klebas of the world, you know, the Trey Burks, these guys and others who understand that from night to night, you may be or may not be in the starting lineup, but your role is still vital given the matchup that you're dealing with from a night to night basis. And I think every player on this team understands that. And I think that starts with Rick Carlisle understanding that, hey, we're going to do what's best for this team in order to try and win basketball games, especially dealing with what they're dealing with from this season on forward now. Oh, for sure. And uh, Cauley Stein might have come off the bench last night, but he had a a really strong performance in that as well uh, as the Mavericks unveil their new defensive player of the night, which is something only awarded when it when your team wins. I think that's the right mentality. (laughs) You don't want to be like proudly holding a belt up or something if uh, if your team lost that night. But right. So it's uh, it's basically the defensive player of the game. It's a custom championship belt like you'd see Mm -hmm. in professional wrestling. And uh, Cauley Stein, he gets it for the inaugural awarding of this, the inaugural champion, if you will. In 19 minutes, he had 10, uh, 10 points, five rebounds, two assists, two blocks, and two steals. Those blocks were on threes. That's really getting after it, too, man. Mm-hmm. That's uh, Cauley Stein. He's been a really good addition, I think, for this team. Obviously, they, I think they're. I don't know what their overall record with him in the starting lineup is at this point, but I know they won like their first four games with him in the starting lineup. And uh, it was definitely a positive infusion for him. He's also going to make some of those plays as well that leaves you scratching your head, like pinning a dunk on the rim and missing <laughs> alley-oops or chip shots around the bucket where you're just like, you had 10 and nine, like 10 points in 19 minutes. That's awesome. I feel like you should have had like 16 or 17 maybe, but uh, I mean, whatever. Yeah. I think the Mavericks have done a good job of allowing him to grow as a player. He's got a lot of potential with his length and his ability to alter shots for shock sure. shots. Yeah, I think they're allowing him the space to actually grow as a player where in the first couple of stops that he had with Sacramento and Golden State, you know, really didn't have the chance to develop as a player. And I think the Mavericks see what they he can bring from a defensive standpoint, especially. And plus, he's hyper athletic, so he can run and transition, can get out and get things as far as alley oops are concerned. He does a lot of different things that the Mavs like to do from a defense to offense transition type point there. And I think they're allowing him to grow. And I think you're seeing some of that come to fruition with more consistent playing time and having a defined role on what he's being asked to do and improving on that game in and game out. So I'm really happy for Willie Cauley-Stein to see him getting the kind of opportunities that he's been getting, but also allowing the opportunity to be growing and developing as a player, especially when you've got a staff like you do with the Dallas Mavericks here. Yeah, he he said after the game, uh, this is that's probably the biggest role I have on the team. Being this is him talking about his defensive performance, uh, biggest role I have on the team being a rim protector, helping out guys flying around, making energy plays. And tonight I did that really well, and we got the W. So yeah, he he gets his role, and I think this is to your point definitely a place where he'll have not just the guys who can set him up better and help him succeed. But I think he has now a coach and everything in that regard. Kerr's obviously a very good coach as well. I just don't think he had the same opportunity, especially in what last year was for the Warriors. But I I don't, I think he's in a very good situation uh, to thrive. I mean, we remember uh, Brendan Wright and everything and Mm -hmm. kind of what guys of a similar sort of ilk in that regard, the long athletic players um, who kind of bounce around, but they come here to Dallas and they find a really nice role. Although, uh, I think Wright was a little bit more efficient on finishing alley-oop dunks from what we've seen start, start of this year, but it, it's, it's a very good fit. I, I think, I think uh, some fans might have a little bit of unjust frustration with him, maybe just in the sense that 
they don't take into acknowledgement for whatever fantasy trades or whatever they wanted for the off season. They didn't really take into consideration what, you know, what money we actually had like $9 million or something to that effect. And so when they see not any big trades or anything like that go down, but just bringing him back on a two year deal, the reaction is like, Oh, that's all we did. And so then any mistake he makes kind of gets highlighted in that regard. But Mm -hmm. I think he is starting to just with his positive impact on the court. And as I said earlier, in the starting lineup, they won their first four games at the very least. And uh, you see how he's kind of helping this team and positively impacting it uh, to the point now where they're like, well, at least it's not Dwight Powell, <laughs> which is the most <laughs> maligned Maverick on the roster. But it's uh, he's doing he's doing well. He's growing into the role, and I think he'll have an opportunity to be a, a good, good rotation player for us for sure. No, I agree. And, you know, Powell has been a guy who's been – a guy who at times gets a bad rap for, you know, what he does on the floor, both offensively and defensively. But we all know that Powell's been a leader on this team for a really long time. And yep. he has some value on this team still with respect to his leadership, his ability at times to really be able to finish at the basket. We know how efficient of a rim runner he is, you know, with Luka Doncic. And I think Willie Collie Stein is fitting into that role fairly well, a more athletic guy, a little bit taller in terms of his length. And he's finding that role, that Dwight Powell-ish role and being able to do it at a little bit more high of a level just because of his ability to be much more athletic at that particular position. But all of these guys are going to have to be counted on at some point and during this season to be able to help this team get to where they think they can go as far as being a potential top four seed in the Western Conference. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll see how they're able to to adjust. They got the Spurs up next in San Antonio, and then they come back to Dallas for a refreshing change of pace <laughs> to take on the Rockets. So it'll be interesting to see how they're able to, to kind of build on this win. I think they found a lot of things that worked for them really well last night. I'd like to see KP running more at the five for sure. So hopefully they can build on that, start making some improvements on the offensive end of the floor where they were so, so good last year and just have not been so good this year. Uh, And if we get that, we'll get some maybe momentum going. But Kevin, thank you for jumping on here, talking with me and everything. Always always a pleasure to talk Mavs basketball with someone who has their head screwed on straight and everything. (laughs) I appreciate it, man. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll have to do it again sometime. Most definitely. Yeah. Just let me know. I would love to do it again for sure. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right. Well, guys, don't forget to like this video, drop a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect and the Kevin Gray Jr. Show. That's I got that right, right? Kevin Gray Sports on YouTube. Sports. Sorry. Sorry. For some reason, I wanted to say the gray area. And then I was like, wait a minute. I don't know if that's like I I got twisted up. I got twisted up. That's all right. I'll I'll have the link in the description to make sure I don't mess it up. (laughs) But uh, yes, so subscribe to his show, his channel as well. And uh, until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.